I can't believe I'm introducing another person right after Sanjay who needs no introduction. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to say about this guy that you guys don't already know. I mean, he's one of the most patient uh, answerer of reef aquarium questions. He's got a you know, really unique way of looking at things, uh, he's responsible for so many advancements and breakthroughs in the reef aquarium hobby. Um, he promotes mangroves like it's the most important thing in reef tanks. Um, but yeah, Julian Sprung is a mentor and uh, he's just been around forever. He's published so much back when we all actually read physical media, but he's still out here putting out some really, really great products. And uh, I'll just never forget that uh, I actually met Julian Sprung at Macna, uh, maybe like 12 years ago when it was my birthday. And I asked him to sign my book. And instead of signing my book, he drew a, a doodle of an orange spotted filefish blowing out candles on a birthday cake. And I was getting angry. I'm like, what are you doing to my book? <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, you guys know that I know my stuff, but when I am stumped, he is one of two or three people that I will call for deeper answers. And uh, even if I have you know, a complicated problem or really want uh, some feedback that I can trust, Julian Sprung is the man. So let's give this guy a welcome that he deserves, Mr. Julian Sprung. Thank you very, very much, Jake. I appreciate that introduction. Everybody needs an introduction. It's always very nice. Um, so I am uh, going to talk to you today about a, a topic uh, that uh, became an area of interest for me as a result of the experience that, that I had and many aquarists in, in South Florida had with uh, Hurricane Irma. I've given this lecture um, several times over the past year, and I've, I've had the benefit of feedback from members in the audience who have raised their hands and, and shared their experience and what they do as a, as a way to prevent losing uh, the, the aquarium and the animals and plants that they have. Um, and all of that feedback has resulted in the current form of this lecture. I'm not one to go and lecture the same thing over and over and over again. I might give uh, a talk for a year at most and then de develop something new. So I, I was, you know, lucky to um, have a lot of good feedback and I think you'll find something interesting in this. Let's see if it works. I have a intro song which I've never done before. Yes, it does. <coughs> I hear some giggling, maybe a few people know this song. It's a hurricane. Everybody uh, trying to run and hide. Okay, that's the late Charles Bradley and a very good song if you have a chance to listen to that. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about not just uh, hurricanes, but um, any kind of a power outage in a natural disaster that could leave you without an aquarium very quickly. So, where this all began. Last year, this was uh, a little bit before Hurricane Irma hit, uh, everything was stable and quite beautiful on the home front. Uh, many of you probably saw some of these photos were published in Coral Magazine. Uh, this is uh, my largest reef aquarium, which at the time was, let's see, about 11 years old. So, uh, you know, the corals were nice and grown in. And we got this wonderful news. If you ever live in a, a place where hurricanes hit, like South Florida, um, you dread <laughs> August and September, and then you know, everything's going good. You think, wow, you know, we, we've 
dodged the, the bullet this year too, there's not another hurricane. And as soon as you have that thought, literally the next day, <laughs> Noah is saying, oh, by the way, yes, there's a hurricane coming. And I've lived through many of them um, and have had you know, various uh, things that we've done to make our house uh, more secure. Um, I have basically stayed home during uh, all the other hurricanes, but when I saw this forecast, you know, I was thinking of that old scene from Airplane, you know, where Lloyd Bridges, it's coming at us, you know. Um, it was looking like it was coming right at us. So for the first time I evacuated because that seemed like the smart thing to do. Category five storm, I live on the water, didn't look like a good <laughs> way to stay. Um, so I put up sandbags around the house because we were worried about uh, storm surge. Um, I have impact glass windows all the way around. We installed those in our house very shortly after we bought it. Um, my mother was ill at the time and um, she was under 24-hour care. We had to move her to a special facility that you know, was guaranteed to have power. And um, that was a main concern for me. Uh, my mind was really on that. And I had backup batteries like you use for your computers, and I had used them previously with very low power consumption air pumps. And so that was what I did, and that had worked previously when I was at home. We also have uh, the benefit of our house being located by a main street, and it's also close to a school. And every other hurricane, the power almost didn't go out, or if it went out, it was at most a day. Um, so that was in my mind, but that didn't happen in Irma. Anyway, that just shows you the sandbags that uh, my son and I filled, uh, just sand from the property. I had lots of fish bags that I was able to fill up like that. So, uh, and by the way, that, that took some time. We had a lot of time with Hurricane Irma. And they don't always give you that much time. Often it's only a day or so. And we had a few days to prepare, and I should have at that moment been buying chillers. Uh, but my mind was, I was worried about mom and, and other stuff, so. And another thing I, I've forgotten about because it had been quite some time since we'd had a hurricane uh, was the curfew issue. Um, you forget that, you know, not only are things different, but you, you can't just hop in the car and go anyplace. Um, so we stayed in my mother's home, which is about an hour away from mine. And I just figured as soon as the storm passed, I'd hop in my car and, and just drive home and make sure everything was okay. But there was a curfew, you were not allowed to drive, I wasn't able to go. And the police had blocked the road uh, entering Miami Beach, so even by the time I came, um, I shouldn't have been able to get there, but I, I knew the area very well and I was able to get around the police blockade. So um, before the first time I gave this lecture on the way through Miami, Inter Miami International Airport, they, they have this wonderful display from, of taxidermied fish, and I thought, oh, I'll add that to my talk. I think it's very apropos. Uh, quite interesting to look at artistically what you can do with, with taxidermied fish. And so I also have my little death art picture. Um, so when I got home, uh, this is what I found. Um, some of these fish were quite old. The uh, black uh, Ocellaris clownfish on the upper left uh, was 21 years old when she passed away. And uh, most of the fish there were about 10 years, some of them only uh, five. But uh, they, were, they were my pets, these were my babies, and, and I failed them, I blew it. So, um, you know, I was hopeful that the batteries would last longer, but the power went out right away before the storm came. Uh, and even though <clears throat> my aquariums are open top, which gives good gas exchange, power went out, air conditioning went out, Tanks get hot, solubility of oxygen goes down, so they couldn't survive long enough for me to get home. I should have stayed home, but you know, we never knew. So take a break for a moment and show you the 
devastation uh, on Miami Beach. This is something that after hurricanes I always love to do. I mean, it's sad to see all the dead organisms on the beach, but there's also quite a few live ones that you can collect. Um, there's unfortunately a sea turtle that passed on, some game fish. I found this puffer fish very, very far from the ocean, but as you can see in the picture, it was alive. Um, so I rescued, so a little bit of karma after killing all of my babies, <laughs> I was able to save this puffer fish. But that's what you see on Miami Beach, lots of sea fans and gorgonians, some stony corals, sponges. Um, and most of them are alive, some of them too beaten up to save. Uh, when this happens, uh, I, you know, will frequently collect the gorgonians like this and throw them into a spot I know in the bay where they'll survive. So back home, trouble, yeah, no power. Um, I've been there before, and as I said, it's normally when, when I'm at home. So the first thing I did was to connect an inverter to my wife's car. Uh, and the inverter, you can easily uh, plug into the car and then plug all your pumps into the inverter and then get the power going. Um, and that bought me time to figure out what I needed to do, uh, which of course I needed a generator. And right at that moment, after I had completed the connections and got the pumps running, I got a phone call, and that was Colin Ford, who um, many of you know Colin from Coral Morphologic. He had stayed on Miami Beach at another home where he had some of his corals uh, in a, an Aquarius uh, system, a large system. And he just called up and said, hey, Julian, how are you? I said, oh, not too good. He said, you need a generator? I said, right on time. <laughs> Uh, because the truth was, I did have a generator, but it was at my office. And if I were to drive off the beach to go to the office, I wouldn't, necess wouldn't necessarily have been able to drive back onto the beach. So he was there in five minutes. We hooked up the generator and then disconnected the inverter. So Colin to the rescue. Um, those are my uh, SPS corals. And this was uh, photographed quite a while after, probably weeks later, but what I want to say is, day one, these guys were okay. Day two, not so good. Day three, mm, it became apparent it was time to take them out. So even they were, they were still alive, I just took them out and said, forget it, because they were going to nuke the tank. They were going to die. Um, now the stylophora on the bottom middle left there, that had actually survived but got a, um, an infection after the fact and I just decided to sacrifice it. I had other fragments from it. And I want to also point out just uh, an interesting concept here. Aside from the one acropora that's next to that stylophore that, and that acropora I got from Sanjay, um, all of these acroporas, including the, the stylophore there, are available from oceans, reefs, and aquariums, from ORA. So, and I don't mean just that it's the species that's available, the same genetic stock. So even though those corals died, they're, they're still alive. Uh, I can replace them with the identical genetic material. And that's interesting that we're at this, this point in the hobby. Uh, what I want to mention why these in particular died uh, as you know, they are much more sensitive to temperature. So as I mentioned, I should have been buying a chiller. I didn't, and I didn't have a way to control temperature in my aquariums. I couldn't just go now and buy one because all the pet shops were closed in Miami as a result of the hurricane. Um, so that was something to remember, even though 99 out of 100 days <laughs> for many, many years, I don't need a chiller during a natural disaster, I do. As I mentioned, there was that infection that got that stylophora. There were these post-trauma infections, and if you're not careful, they can take out the survivors. See that white spot there? Um, that I had to go in with the Julian's thing and, and slurp that off. That's Begiotoa. It's a type of bacterial infection. And these were showing up all over the place in the tank. Um, water was warm still, uh, even though the water was circulating um, and it's something you have to consider after a major trauma. But all is not lost, uh, you know, 
That doesn't look like an empty tank, does it? This is post Irma. No Acropora, but the corals survived. No fish, unfortunately. But there were some fish that survived. This is the male of that pair that were 21 years old last year. So 22 years old now, and he at that time uh, is now a she. Uh, because I've paired him with the other one who lost its mate. So the two males go together, and in case you don't know it, clownfish has changed sex. Um, so I put them together. They're both males. They got along fine, and now the black Ocellaris is the female. Uh, the Duncan corals there are, yes, original strains uh, that I've had all these years since the 1990s, um, and they survived. Duncans are tough as nails. And uh, yeah, it was, it was tough coming home to an empty tank after all those years. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, so this was September last year. Uh, the November before that, I lost my, my dog, my Westie, uh, after 15 years. So that was getting used to coming home and not having him to greet me. It was really unbearable coming home and not having my fish. So I, um, I saw a post online, Austin Lefebvre, uh, you all know Austin. Uh, he posted a, a picture of this orange tail imperator angel, and I, I saw it, and I immediately fired off a message and said, do you still have that fish? And he did, and I got it. And so there's my comfort fish. Anybody who's ever kept an imperator knows this is a very uh, emotive fish that's very happy to see you when you come home. Um, I got a yellow tang to help deal with the algae that was starting to creep up as a result of the trauma. And you can see, this is you know, approximately two months after Irma. Things are coming around. The uh, Syriatopora hystrix survived, miraculously. And it's now a gigantic colony. It's grown quite a bit in the past year. Um, an interesting effect, uh, which I don't know the cause. All I can say is that it's trauma. The um, Montipora capricornis developed these very, very fine uh, little branchy things growing on it immediately after that trauma. And they persist even till today. So there was some impact on, on its uh, genetic uh, growth uh, mechanism. So that was at home, now two little fishies. Two little fishies we, uh, we manufacture in a condominium warehouse uh, facility. And we have uh, three phase power there. Um, the hurricane knocked out one phase. Uh, we'd had uh, storms that had knocked out a phase before, and when that happened, I was able to determine which outlets in the warehouse uh, maintained power, even though one phase was out. And so the aquariums were plugged into those outlets. Uh, so even though we didn't have air conditioning, we weren't able to run any of the machinery, the aquariums still had power. So this is uh, you know, somewhat famous from online videos, mangrove aquarium with LPS corals. And fortunately, it, it survived. Um, I had only a couple of losses there, really only due to temperature. You know, so these corals have all survived. The only one that didn't survive there. Well, let's see, I'll give you. In the upper corner is a um, Alveopora minuta. And uh, that one was just too sensitive to the temperature. But I've since gotten a replacement of the same genetic material. It's being aquacultured. Uh, I got a frag of that. Jake was helpful. He spotted it, and he saw that I wanted that. Yeah, so all of these are fine. That clownfish is, um, it's now 21 years old. I got that in 97. That's a uh, teal eye hybrid. And uh, I keep it in that tank because with a low water level, there's almost no chance that it would jump. So yeah, uh, this system was at 91, almost 92 degrees for nine days. And the coral survived. Uh, there are other tanks at Two Little Fishies that were not so lucky. Um, one tank uh, was in uh, the 
office manager's office and I had the door closed there and that's the only aquarium left that still has a metal halide light on it and before we left before the hurricane I didn't turn the metal halide off mm. that was a mistake because it was a closed room and over 90 degrees <laughs> and no you know with a metal halide on it. so it got too warm that cooked that tank so you <laughs> have to think about things like that Anyway, uh, after the nine days, I, there was a pet store, Exotic Aquariums in Miami. They were open. I was able to buy this chiller and get the temperature down to the normal 77 degrees, and the corals recovered. Uh, something else you can do that's helpful is uh, use cooling fans like this one. There are many of them available on the market. And while they won't work like a chiller, they might help you bring the tank temperature down at least a couple of degrees. Of course, that's more effective if the humidity level is low in the house, which is not the case in South Florida. Uh, but the movement of water that's affected by uh, the fan blowing across the surface can also be helpful. Um, and for some of you out there, heat is not an issue, you know, the tank being too warm, cold is. So you could have a natural disaster like a, an ice storm in winter, and then you need to, of course, consider how to heat your aquarium. What can be done? Well, first of all, it depends where you live. Are you in a house? Are you in a condominium, rental apartment, office, school, public aquarium? The answer is different depending on where your reef aquarium is located. Of course, the general answer that people think of is, yes, have a generator. And yeah, that is kind of the standard. And there are many different types, some of them loud and no, you know, noisy, pain in the ass, they won't start, and other ones are quick, easy to start. But if they are uh, a gasoline-operated generator, you have to remember that in a hurricane, you can have gas lines like this, and it can be a challenge. As I mentioned, also, there could be a curfew where you can't leave to even go get the gas. And then you run out of gas, so then you may not have you got a nice generator, but no way to run it. So generators are not foolproof. Yeah, and really nobody's gonna care <laughs> about you and your damn corals. <laughs> so, you know, if you can't get the gas. Um, yeah, things are really different when there's a natural disaster. Um, you can't just go wherever you want to, pop in your car, nothing's open, no internet. All those things that you rely on the internet for, <laughs> forget it. No cell phone service. You know, you think, oh yeah, the landline's down, I'll use my cell. No, I can't do that either. You're really out of connection with everyone, with the world. Back to generators again. So you do have these Generac generators that can be powered by natural gas, whether you have a natural gas line directly to your house or if you have a big natural gas tank. Um, this is the gold standard of backup plan for many, many aquariums and you know, people who have a hobby. So if you can afford it, and they're not horribly expensive, they're not cheap, uh, this is the way to go. The nice thing about these generators is that they have a, um, an exercise cycle. That means that it automatically turns on and runs. Because if you have a generator, and you don't have storms every month. <laughs> you might have a storm every five years, if you're lucky. Um, when you go to start the generator, it may not work. Uh, that's why these things have that, that design feature of, of running about every week, you know, a couple of times a month at least, to make sure that it's operating. So the only thing that you need to really look after is that the oil, is, the oil levels are right. Um, so these are good. Do I have one? No. I don't, but um, a neighbor of mine does, and, and it has always worked for, for him, and uh, you know, it's something to consider. There are different size ones, too, so you can look at it and figure out what size you really need for your essential loads, like your chiller, uh, your pumps, your refrigerator, things like that. So, but there are also low-budget quick fixes that'll help you uh, in the event of either a short or long-term outlet. I mentioned the inverter earlier. You don't need to have a 2300 watt inverter. You could probably get a 400 watt one and that'll be just fine. Um, these are very inexpensive and just handy. You, you connect it to the 
uh, cigarette lighter outlet of your car and then you're able to plug extension cords into it and plug a number of different uh, pumps and other apparatus into it. So here's something that I really, really like, the uh, new uh, lithium-ion power stations. And there are a number of different brands of these. And I, I personally consider this the best um, quick fix. Everyone should have this. Um, su Suaoki, I don't know how to, how to pronounce it, or Sueoki. This is one of the popular ones. Um, Goal Zero, uh, I think this one is probably going to be the market leader. Um, they have a number of different options. And here they're on the Goal Zero website, you can see here's someone who bought it uh, after Hurricane Irma, and somebody on Puerto Rico. Remember, Irma hit Puerto Rico first, and then you had Maria come in to do the final one two punch. Um, so there you see this lithium ion um, battery backup connected to solar power panels, and they sell both of those. Uh, so you have the ability to maintain power for, for days when there's no power in the grid this way. Charge this thing up uh, during the day with the solar cells and you're able to run all night all your pumps. Uh, nice, nice little feature. There are smaller ones that would not have that capacity, but they have higher capacity ones as well. On a smaller scale, battery backup air pumps are handy to have. You can't have enough of these. There are quite a few different brands available. Um, if you look online, there's even solar-powered ones for, for ponds. There are even solar-powered water pumps that could be incorporated in a backup plan. Uh, this is a, a quite powerful solar-powered uh, pump that has the panel built into the pump that you get about 50 hours continuous duty from a full charge. Impressive. And then we get to Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> What is that about? I don't know. So I, the first time I gave this lecture, I think it was at Rifa Palooza, uh, after the talk, someone came up and said, oh, you know, I came up with this nifty solution and it helped me out in Hurricane Irma. Um, you know, if you ever seen the science experiment where you cut up a piece of potato and put it into hydrogen peroxide and it gives off bubbles of oxygen. I mean, most of you know if you ever put hydrogen peroxide on a wound, you see it fizzing. And that is a reaction of the enzyme catalase with the peroxide and it liberates free oxygen. So here was a really inventive solution. I mean, it's not too hard to find a potato in the house, right? And most of us have hydrogen peroxide. So Michael Thompson, who shared this with me, uh, also sent me this picture of his apparatus and that's how he maintained his aquarium during the power outages after Hurricane Irma. He got a little water bottle, cut up the potato, stuck it in there, poured the hydrogen peroxide, cut a little hole in the cap, ran the air hose in there, had a little issue with foaming, but he was able to come up with the, the right amount of potato and the right size of potato and some cotton or floss in there to prevent the foam from going into the tube. And it's bubbling pure oxygen through the air stone into the tank. Bravo <laughs> to him, I like that solution. And there are, of course, these battery backups for the Vortec pumps from Ecotech Marine. Should have that if you have those pumps. APC battery backups. I do not recommend this. Uh, this was actually what I used, and that's why I failed. <laughs> so um, don't do it. I mean, if you absolutely have no other choice, okay. But... Uh, it's not a, not a good idea. This was something I saw when I was doing Google search on battery backups. And I feel sorry for this guy who had to pose for that picture. But um, uh, those of you who live north of Florida and actually have basements, um, you know you need a sump in case there's a flood in the basement. And you have a sump pump to help keep the basement dry. So they have these battery backups to keep the pump running in case of a flood and power outage. And they, they have a, quite a capacity. There's this Sump Pro, which would be a great name in the aquarium hobby, right? Um, that, uh, you know, they're designed to run these sump pumps, which draw a fair amount of power. So something like this, if you happen to have it for your sump pump in your, um, what you, you know, to, to control flooding, 
uh, in your basement, um, it could be incorporated to use for your aquarium, especially if your aquarium filtration is in the basement. So what is my long-term plan? Aside from the lithium ion backups, which I consider essential, um, I, I was weighing the options of getting a generator, uh, which I showed you earlier, versus having solar photovoltaic. And I've wanted to get solar panels on my roof for years and years, and I think Hurricane Irma finally gave me the excuse to say, well, I gotta have this. So, you know, I've wanted it and wanted it, and now I've, I've rationalized it, uh, that this is the way to go. Uh, and there's a real benefit, of course, unlike a generator, you use solar power every single day. Downside, of course, is it's not a solution for everyone. If you're in an apartment and you're renting, it's not something that you can do. So this is really if you own your own home. This is just a rough drawing that the estimator did um, showing the uh, panel. I've got a 12 kilowatt system, and the palm trees there are, are showing a little bit of shade. So in order to be green, I had to kill green. <laughs> um, so those palm trees are still there, but I do need to cut them down. They do uh, reduce the efficiency. Uh, so these things don't come cheap. Uh, that's $36,000 for that system. There is a 30% uh, federal tax rebate. So that brings the total down to about $22,000. Now, that's a lot of money. But uh, what you have to bear in mind is if you're in a home, and you have an electric bill, which I think every single one of us do, we all have an electric bill, um, and it has a certain cost. Do we all just accept that cost? Yeah, it's kind of, you know, in a way it's like our um, cable bill or whatever, you know, it's just, it's a, a utility and we're used to it and we pay it every month and we don't question it. Well, if you buy a solar panel system for your house, and you finance it, your cost will be approximately the same as your utility bill. So, it's just like deciding, do I pay the utility company or do I pay the bank? And eventually you pay off the financing. So, you can decide to keep the utility company happy forever and ever, or not. So, there are many different types of loans available currently at roughly, you know, between 5 or up to 6%. Um, if you do these loan calculators, you'll see um, at 5% interest rate, 20-year um, repayment, your monthly payment would be $145. But of course, then your, your interest payments would be quite a lot. And maybe that bothers you paying the interest. It doesn't bother you when you pay the utility company every month. You don't even think about it. Oh my God, it'll be that much forever and ever, and they're going to raise the rates. Um, now here on tenure, you cut your interest in half and your monthly payment is $233, which is probably about what many of you are paying monthly. It's about what I was paying monthly. So uh, here we see it about $200 a month. This was in, in the year 2016. I went out and I bought an electric car that made my monthly bills average go up to $230. But now with the solar panels, there's the usage, and the utility bill is $9. And, and that $9 is automatic. That's what you pay to be connected to FPL. And that's not power consumption. So, but solar power alone will not power your home when the grid is down. So when the power goes out, solar panels are there, you still don't have power. That's a safety feature. You need battery backup. So battery storage is another investment, and that's where you actually get beyond that cost of, of uh, your utility bill. So it's something to consider. Uh, Tesla Powerwall is, is sort of the premium one if you can buy it. I've uh, put money down on this, and I still don't have one. It's been a year. Um, so I don't know. There are other battery systems that are available. And this is, this is not mine. This is just from the Tesla website. Uh, it's connected to the panel. You can put another panel there. You see the one called Essential Loads. That's where you can put in um, breakers for your various, you know, for your chiller, for your refrigerator, the things that you want to make sure you have power for. 
Refrigerator's kind of important, yeah. Uh, the Goal Zero Yeti that I showed, showed earlier, the lithium ion uh, backup power supply, they also have a little kit that you can connect to your panel so that you can connect the uh, backup that way. But most people would probably just run extension cords and connect it to the, uh, to the Yeti. Um, wind power is, of course, another option. Um, and, you know, not many of us do it, but it's something to consider. Hooked up the same way, you know, with battery backup. And lastly, uh, you know, nowadays uh, there, there are these wonderful systems um, for computer control of various apparatus and being able to use our smartphones and, and look at it. Of course, if the uh, smartphone is not operating because the, the grid is down and, and the towers aren't working. You won't be able to watch your aquarium, but you could if you were evacuated and, and the power was, was running. If you had a, a uh, backup generator that automatically kicked on, you'd be able to see what was happening in your aquarium, and this is different from years past. I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I didn't run over. That's amazing. <laughs> um, anybody have any questions? Thank you.